boa tarde. O meu nome é Liliana Coutinho, eu sou programadora de conferências e debates da Cultura Geste. Uh, e em nome da Cultura Geste gostaria de, de agradecer a vossa presença aqui hoje e também fazer uma breve apresentação do nosso convidado, alguém que para muitos dos que estão aqui não necessita de apresentação, porque o seu trabalho é uma referência uh, no campo da teoria crítica, da história, da filosofia política, também com algumas incursões no terreno da estética. A leitura dos seus textos, dos seus livros, uh, é fundamental para quem quer pensar um mundo pós-colonial e para quem trabalha também no âmbito da política africana. E embora uh, seja um olhar que parte muito desse território, as questões que o professor Achille Mbembe uh, levanta são questões de ordem planetária. Uh, Achille Mbembe uh, nasceu nos Camarões, uh, estudou História e Ciências Políticas uh, na Universidade de Paris I, uh, Sorbonne e na, no Instituto de Ciências Políticas de Paris. Ensinou em várias universidades, em Berkeley, Yale, Colômbia, e neste momento ensina em Harvard, e uh, em Joanesburgo, na Universidade de Witwatersrand, no Instituto de uh, Investigação, uh, Pesquisa Social e Económica. Um, ainda dentro deste, deste, do contexto de ensino e de partilha e de transmissão de pensamento, acho que um dos contextos importantes a referir são os ateliês de la pensée, os ateliês do pensamento, que co-criou com um outro pensador senegalês, Félio Inzar, Uh, e que uh, junta e irá juntar para o ano, pela terceira vez, uh, os, alguns dos principais pensadores de África e, de, e da diáspora. Um, alguns dos seus livros, que são sobejamente conhecidos, uh, Sortir de la Grande Nuit, Essai sur l'Afrique décolonisée, ou On the Post Colony, em português, temos traduzidos uh, Políticas da Inimizade e Crítica da Razão Negra, pela mão da Marta Lança, editados na Antígona. Quem não conhecer, nós temos uh, hoje estes, estes livros disponíveis na nossa livraria. Um, este ano, em 2018, uh, a professora Achille Membe uh, foi galardoado com os prémios Ernest Bloch e Gerda Enkel. São dois prémios que são atribuídos por duas fundações alemãs uh, a pessoas que uh, têm um trabalho que é considerado de referência na área de, de, das ciências sociais. Uh, a cerimónia de entrega de um destes prémios foi ontem, em Düsseldorf. Uh, e um, este debate, eu vou já chamá-lo, este debate, uh, esta conferência decorrerá em inglês. Uh, a seguir, depois da, da conferência do professor Achille Mende, Uh, teremos um momento para debate, as questões poderão depois ser colocadas ou em português ou em inglês, eu estarei aqui para ajudar a fazer a moderação. Uh, agora só me resta uh, dar as boas-vindas, chamar o professor Atila Mende, uh, ajudem-me também a uh, uh, dar-lhe as boas-vindas. Uh, welcome, professor Atila Mende. First of all, uh, I would like to uh, tell you how happy I uh, am to, to be here. And uh, uh, I would like to, to use this opportunity to, to express my, my deepest uh, gratitude to the foundation, to the uh, director, Mark and Jose, and uh, all the team that has been uh, working uh, here. Uh, including, of course, Liliana for uh, her a very nice introduction, and uh, Mariana who uh, <clears throat> did everything to uh, to get me here. And uh, I, I'm looking forward uh, to tomorrow's event with uh, the Afro diasporic family, uh, with uh, um, Mamadou, uh, Mamadou Ba and. Uh, and Ruth Gilmore, uh, I'm sure that uh, um, further details will be provided uh, as to that event. 
What I would like to do now is to, to share with you a set of uh, urgent, uh, fragmentary and uh, uh, unfinished reflections on, uh, let's just call it for the time being, the global present. By global present, I simply mean these times of ours, these rather peculiar moment our world is going through, a moment for which there doesn't seem yet uh, to be a proper name. And since naming our time is part of, I think, what is at stake, I suggest that in the midst of the current dread and confusion, one thing at least is clear. Ours is a time of planetary entanglement. I call it a time of planetary entanglement for various structural reasons. The most important of these is that uh, uh, worldwide, the combination of uh, algorithmic capitalism, hyper-technological forms of warfare, and the saturation of the everyday by digital and computational technologies, this combination has led to the acceleration of speed and the intensification of connections, the in inextricability of connections. In fact, we are more than ever before at any other time in human history, we are exposed to each other almost directly, in any case, in ways that are less and less mediated. But entanglement is not all that characterizes the now. These are also times when many are gradually coming to the realization that reason may well have reached its limits. Or in any case, it is a time when reason is once again on trial. And as you know, reason is a faculty we used to recognize in humans and in humans alone. And in the Western tradition, we have all, willingly or not, become the inheritors. Reason was always seen as the highest of all human faculties, the one that opened the doors of knowledge, uh, eventually of wisdom, in any case of virtue, and most importantly, of freedom. The fact is that today, many don't trust reason any longer. They don't believe any longer in its power to free us from ignorance or to lead us in the path of truth. Today, reason is on trial in two ways. On the one hand, the logic of reason is morphing from within machines and computers and algorithms. As a result, an inordinate amount of power 
is gradually being ceded to abstractions of all kinds. So we are more than ever before ruled by abstractions. Old modes of reasoning are being challenged by new ones that originate through and within technology in general and digital technologies in particular, as well as through the top-down models of artificial intelligence. The result is that the human brain is no longer the privileged location of reason. It is as if the human brain was being downloaded into all kinds of nanotechnologies and nanomachines. So, techne, the Greek term techne, is becoming the quintessential language of reason, its only legitimate manifestation. And techne, in turn, does not uh, only signal the triumph of instrumental and abstract reason. Reason in the guise of techne is increasingly weaponized. That reason has become a weapon through its uh, 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 capture by instrumental and technological uh, logics. That on the one hand. On the other hand, many are turning their back to reason in favor of other faculties and other modes of expression and cognition. They are calling for a rehabilitation of affect and feelings and emotions, for instance. And indeed, in many of the ongoing political struggles of our times, passion is clearly trumping reason. Confronted with complex issues, acting with one's guts viscerally rather than reasonably, is fast becoming the norm. So this is one of the many key features of our times. There are other features. For instance, these are times, too, when we don't know any longer what to do with those who knock at our door. We don't want to know about those people who happen to be amongst us, who happen to be with us, but who are not, so to say, of us. We believe that we do not need them. And we don't want them to need us. We just want them out. So this urge to expel, to be without rather than to be with, this urge is significant, it seems to me, of the extent to which we want to cut any relation with them. It is also significant of the extent to which we do not believe any longer in the very idea of debt, or, if you want, in the idea of owing something to anybody who is not us or of us. The urge for separation, the desire for apartheid, dreams of exit, of self-enclaving, infatuation with ignorance and indifference. This extends including to the economic models that govern our lives, the end of long-term contracts, 
masters who do no longer need slaves because they have come to the realization that to be free from slaves is better than to own them. Forsaking or externalizing any kind of relationship that comes with a set of obligations is therefore typical of the spirit of the age. So I just told you about these times as being times of planetary entanglement. What I'm saying now is that in addition to this, and indeed wherever we look, the drive is simultaneously towards contraction, the drive is towards containment, and it is towards inclusion. These two things going on simultaneously. And as is part of the paradox of our times. Now you will ask me, but what do you mean by enclosure? What do you mean by contraction? And what do you mean by containment? These three notions, in my mind at least, refer to two key developments which have undergone a kind of acceleration since the last quarter of the 20th century, a kind of acceleration triggered, at least in part, by the explosive nature of new technological inventions. What are these two developments? The first development has been the uh, erection uh, worldwide of all kinds of walls and fortifications, gates and enclaves. In other words, various practices of uh, partitioning space, of offshoring and fencing of uh, wealth, of uh, splintering territories, of breaking territorial continuities, fragmenting spaces, saddling them with various kinds of borders so as to better control movement and speed, accelerating it here, decelerating it uh, there, and in the process, sorting people, recategorizing them, reclassifying them with the goal of uh, better selecting a new who is whom, who should be where, who shouldn't, all in the name of security. So security, if you want, has become the sacrament of our times. As a result, borders are no longer merely lines of demarcation separating distinct sovereign entities. Increasingly, they are the name used to describe the organized violence that underpins both contemporary capitalism and our world order in general. The women, the men, the unwanted children condemned to abandon or kept in cages, the shipwrecks and drownings of hundred almost weekly, in short, the image of a humanity on the road to ruin. But perhaps, to be exact, we should speak not of borders in general, but of borderization. Whatever the case, the technological transformation of borders is in full swing physical and virtual barriers of separation, digitalization of databases, huge filing systems, the development of new tracking devices, sensors, drones, satellites, sentinel robots, infrared detectors, and various other cameras 
biometric controls, new microchips containing personal details, everything is put in place to transform the very nature of the border, to turn the border, in fact, into a mobile, a portable, and an omnipresent or ubiquitous reality. In fact, as far as some of us are concerned, everything is done to turn our very skin itself into a border. What then is borderization? If not the process by which certain spaces are transformed into uncrossable places for certain classes of populations. I'm sorry, this bottle doesn't want to stay still. <laughs> it's trying to come down here and create chaos. <laughs> so I'll just take a second to put it in a proper place so that I don't have to push it back uh, constantly. So now the, bo uh, the bottle is, is, is in its proper place and we can, we can uh, move on. So borderization as what as indeed this process by which certain spaces are transformed into uncrossable places, not for everybody, but for certain classes of populations who in the process undergo forms of racialization. Places where the lives of a multitude of people judged to be undesirable come to be shattered. Borderization justified as I suggested earlier in the name of security. Now the dream, because it's a dream, of perfect security requires not only complete systematic surveillance, but also a cleansing policy. This dream is symptomatic of the structural tensions that for decades have accompanied our transition into a new technical system of increased automation, one that is increasingly complex, yet also increasingly abstract, comprised of multiple screens, digital algorithmic, and so on. And in a sense, one of the major consequences of the acceleration of technological innovations has been the creation of a segmented planet of multiple speeds. So that's the first set of references I attach to the terms enclosure, uh, contraction, and containment. Let me now move to the second set of references. By enclosure, contraction, and containment, I also refer to a matrix of, of rules, rules mostly designed for those human bodies deemed either in excess, unwanted, illegal, dispensable, or superfluous. Indeed, perhaps more than at any other moment in our recent past, we are increasingly faced with the question of what to do with those whose very existence does not seem to be necessary for our reproduction. Those whose mere existence or proximity is deemed to represent a physical or biological threat to our own life. Paradigmatic of this matrix of rule 
is present-day Gaza in Palestine. And I would like to say a few words, indeed, on why is it that Gaza has become the paradigm of the type of world I have been describing, and uh, if we are not very careful of the kind of world we'll be inhabiting, all of us, uh, pretty soon. Gaza is paradigmatic on three counts. There might be many, but I'm interested in the following three. On the one hand, it is the culmination of special exclusionary arrangements that existed in an incipient state during the early phases of modern settler or genocidal colonialism. Such was the case of uh, Native American reservations in the United States of America. Such was the case of island prisons, uh, penal colonies, or more recently, such was the case of uh, the Bantu stands uh, in South Africa, uh, once again in the not so distant past. So Gaza represent uh, these early formations, but at uh, an age that is highly technologized. Here in Gaza, control of uh, vulnerable and wanted or surplus people is exercised through a combination of tactics, chief among which is modulated blockade. A blockade, what is it that, what kind of work does a blockade uh, achieve? A blockade prohibits, is meant to prohibit, it's meant to obstruct, it is meant to, to limit who and what can enter and leave the strip, the Gaza Strip. The goal, of course, might not be to cut the strip off entirely from supply lines or infrastructural grids or trade, even trade routes, although that might, be, uh, might happen once uh, in a while. The goal is nevertheless relatively uh, it is uh, to, to, to seal it off in a way which effectively turns it into an imprisoned territory. And I want you to hold on, on to that concept of uh, territories that are turned actually into prisons, large territories. Early on, we had, a, I, mean, I don't know whether Ruth. Ruthie Gilmore is in the room. She's the one who has done, she's right there. Uh, this uh, extraordinary work on, on the prison industry uh, in America. Early on, we had, we had the sense that prisons were a particular space, properly delimited, a building, set of buildings. Here we're talking of a carceral landscape of an entirely different kind which covers entire territories. So, comprehensive or relative closure is, of course, as we all know, accompanied episodically uh, by uh, periodic uh, military escalations, the uh, generalized uh, use of extrajudicial violence or assassinations, uh, spatial violence, uh, humanitarian strategies, um, and a peculiar, uh, I would say, biopolitics of punishment, all combining uh, to produce, in turn, uh, a peculiar carceral space in which uh, people who are deemed surplus, unwanted, or illegal are governed in a very specific way. They are governed through abdication of any responsibility for their lives and their welfare. So it's a, quite a peculiar mode of, of govern, governing. I mean, we know of it. Uh, I speak about Gaza. I could speak about my, the, the very country where I was born, Cameroon, where this mode of governance 
is the no. You govern through abandonment. It's form of you govern through absence. Um, our own head of state, uh, who happens to turn 86 years old very soon, um, has been in power for 36 years. There were elections in Cameroon yesterday, presidential elections. The uh, presidential term in Cameroon is seven years. And uh, our beloved uh, president, who I told you is 86, was one of the eminent candidates. He wants seven more years. Uh, were he to leave uh, during this coming term, he would be 86 plus seven, that's uh, something like 93 years old, by the time his uh, next term comes to an end. Um, over the last 36 years, um, he had spent the equivalent of four full years uh, going back and forth to Switzerland, uh, where he has taken the habit of uh, staying in one of the most uh, uh, um, expensive hotels in Geneva, which is called the Intercontinental Hotel. The cost of uh, which have been calculated, of course, by the experts and uh, are uh, rich amounts that could have been spent uh, otherwise. Strictly speaking, there is nothing he can do in seven years that he had not been able to do in 36 years. And yet, here we are, uh, he wants seven more years of government by abandonment, spectral governance by absence, and so forth and so on. So, uh, that's how I say that Gaza is somewhat paradigmatic of uh, a form of management of unwanted people, surplus people worldwide, not only in Cameroon, but uh, elsewhere in America, uh, uh, as uh, history teaches us. But third, Gaza is also the laboratory for new forms of war that have expanded war and policy, because nowadays there's hardly any difference between uh, waging war and policing uh, unwanted people. The militarization of the police uh, has become a key element of uh, uh, the ways in which uh, certain states uh, regulate uh, space uh, today. Uh, forms of war then that have uh, expanded in places such as Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Syria, uh, and so forth and so on. Now, what kind of war? First of all, a war whose aim is to turn into dust the means of existence and survival of unwanted people. Peculiar to the wars we have witnessed since the end of the 20th century, the last quarter, and then now, peculiar to these wars has been the use, for instance, of uranium warheads and banned weapons like uh, uh, white phosphorus, bombings with uh, high altitude at high altitude of basic infrastructures, uh, usually with a cocktail of cancerous chemical substances deposited in the soil or which fill the air. Uh, the toxic dust in the ruins of towns, most of them raised to the ground, Aleppo, uh, many, many more. The pollution from burning hydrocarbons, and so forth and so on. These are the kinds of new wars that are being waged episodically against uh, either enemies or unwanted populations. In fact, in the last quarter of the 20th century, 
there haven't been any uh, type of bomb to which civilian populations have not been subjected. Just think of it. Conventional blind bombs reconverted usually with uh, central inertial systems in the tail, um, cruise missiles, usually with uh, inbuilt infrared head hunting systems, uh, e bombs destined to paralyze the enemy's electronic nerve centers, bombs that explode in towns emitting rays of energy like lightning bolts, uh, other e-bombs that, uh, whilst not deadly, instead burn their victims and raise the temperature of their skin, or thermobaric bombs that release walls of fire, absorbing all the oxygen from surrounding spaces and which kill with shock waves, asphyxiating nearly everything that breathes. I don't even mention cluster bombs that devastate civilian populations as they break up in the air, uh, dispersing uh, mini munitions designed to explode upon contact of vast areas, a plethora of bombs, uh, demonstrations of untold destructive power. And of course, in the midst of all of that, the population subjected to these forms of, let's call them ecocide, have had to flee. How can we blame them from refusing to survive in the midst of such ruins. So that's the first kind of war which in this new regime of human mobility are being waged against those we don't want. Not here, but over there. Because the border, we have to externalize it we have to put it right there where they are. It has to start from there before it reaches the Mediterranean. Second, this kind of war, which is indeed a war of attrition, which is methodically calculated, which is programmed, which is implemented with new methods, this kind of war is a war against the very idea of mobility. It is a war against the very idea of circulation, and it's a war against the idea of speed. At an age precisely when velocity, increasing abstraction, are, as I told you, the norm. Moreover, and that's the first uh, characterization of these wars, the targets of this kind of warfare are not by any means singular bodies, the war against bodies, but rather great swaths of humanity judged worthless and superfluous, whose every organ must be specifically incapacitated in a way that affects generations to come eyes, the noses, the mouths, the ears, tongues, skin, bones, lungs, intestines, blood, hands, legs, all these maimed people, paralytics and survivors, all these uh, pulmonary diseases like pneumoconiosis, all these traces of uranium on their hair, I uh, don't have any, uh, thousands of cases of cancer, abortions, fetal malformations, birth defects, ruptured thoraxes, dysfunctions of the nervous system, 
all bear witness to a terrible devastation. So all of the above is worth repeating. It belongs to the current practice of remote borderization. I mentioned all of that to suggest to you the colossal price many are paying uh, for the um, implementation of this new practice of remote borderization. Borderization carried from afar, all in the name of freedom and security. So, let me try to summarize all of that. What is going on? Part of what we are witnessing at a planetary level is a bifurcation between life on the one hand and bodies on the other hand. Not every body in both senses of the term, every body and every single body taken separately, not every body is nowadays taken to contain life. Some bodies are taken to contain no life as such. They are, strictly speaking, lifeless bodies. Or they contain the kind of life that is not insured. So if you want, what we are witnessing worldwide is a process of segregation and calculation and measurement and valuation of lives. And the sorting out of those lives that are worth protecting because they are insured financially by a state through the mechanisms of nationality and citizenship. And those other bodies that do not fall into uh, that category of insured lives and insured bodies, and which therefore can be left uh, to uh, abandonment. Or, whenever they try to move, must be tracked, must be captured, housed in camps, and I have to tell you that Europe has never counted as many camps as today, are sorted, recorded by digital machines, and whatever remains of life they harbor must be turned into data. So within this new regime of capture, the life, bodies, and movement of black people in particular, occupy a symptomatic place for all kinds of reasons I can refer to uh, later in the con during the conversation. So the point I really wanted to make is that when we say borders, mobility, circulation, what we are dealing with, what we are facing, is, in fact, a new redistribution of the Earth. A new redistribution of the Earth premised on the capacity to move, on the un an equal redistribution of the capacity to move. And therefore, uh, the uh, uh, separating of those who can move and to whom the earth belongs, and those who cannot move or can only move under certain conditions, because in fine, the earth really doesn't belong to them, or it doesn't belong to them in the same way it belongs to us. That things are fast reaching this point is because a new global security regime is in the making. 
It is characterized by the externalization, militarization, and miniaturization of borders, and endless segmentation and contraction of rights, and an extension of tracking and surveillance as the privileged mode of mitigating risks. Its key function is to enhance mobility for some while impending it or denying it to others. It is paving the way for unprecedented forms of racial violence, most of which target minorities, the disenfranchised, and already vulnerable people. This violence is abetted by new logics of containment and incarceration, expulsion, and deportation. Furthermore, mobility is increasingly defined in geopolitical, military, and security terms. In theory, those who present the lowest risk profile can move. In practice, the calculation of risk mostly serves to justify an equal and discriminatory treatment along the color line. And in this new regime of global movement, Africa is doubly penalized, penalized from the outside and penalized from the inside. Today, there is hardly any country in the world that does not consider migrants from Africa undesirable. I don't know of, I mean, uh, I would be happy to hear from you. I personally don't know of any country on earth where uh, a few African migrants arrive and everybody is clapping or say, oh, welcome. I don't know of any. At the same time, Saddled with hundreds of internal borders, which make the cost of mobility highly prohibitive, Africa is trapped in a slow track lane and increasingly resembles a massive open air prison. In that attempt to contain the migratory flows from Sub Saharan Africa, Europe, for instance, is funding countries of origin and transit so that people seeking to move either do not live in the first place or are in no position to ever cross the Mediterranean and more and more to ever cross the Sahara. In this regard, it seems to me that the ultimate goal of the recently established EU Emergency Trust Fund for Africa is to cut off any credible legal route for African migrations to Europe. So in exchange for money, uh, brutal and corrupt African regimes are entrusted with the task of locking up potential African mi migrants and warehousing asylum seekers. Many of these regimes have been drafted as key cogs in the system of deportation and forced returns that has become a hallmark of European anti-African migration policy. As a matter of fact, no traveling person with an African passport or person of African descent is today free from unreasonable search and seizure. Very few are immune to time-consuming and invasive identity verifications at airports, on trains and highways, or at roadblocks. Very few enjoy the right to a hearing prior to confinement, at the site of inspection, or prior to deportation. At borders and other checkpoints, they are almost automatically among those subjected to scrutiny or closely and thoroughly inspected. Permanently under the gaze 
of racial profiling, they are almost always among those who bear a prohibited or penalized status. As I said, within the continent itself, post-colonial African states have failed to articulate a common legislative framework and policy initiatives in relation to border management, the upgrading of civil registries, a visa liberalization, or the treatment of third country nationals residing legally in member states. So, the end of colonial rule has not ushered a new era characterized by the extension of the right to freedom of movement to all. Instead, colonial boundaries have been made intangible and no decisive push towards regional integration has been recorded with the exception, of course, of uh, a few regions such as uh, uh, West Africa. So let me move towards the end. Clearly, this is not sustainable, neither for the continent nor for our planet at large. It's simply not uh, feasible to turn large chunks of our planet into open air prisons. It is simply too late, if you want. Or if we really want to move in that direction, uh, we have to know that the cost will be uh, quasi-genocidal. So Europe has a choice, either to contribute to a new imagination of how we share the earth by uh, equally redistributing the capacities for mobility or to go the way it wants to go right now and uh, uh, assume uh, all uh, uh, the uh, political and moral consequences of this. Now, if we want to reimagine a different mobility regime of a planetary dimension, um, there are a few steps we have to take. First of all, we have to distance ourselves from the categories and concepts borrowed from the Western lexicon, such as national interests, risks, threats, national security, categories which in any case for us in Africa might not be helpful. Why? Because they refer to a philosophy of movement and a philosophy of space entirely predicated on the existence of an enemy in a world of hostility. This is the reason why today uh, deeply ingrained traditions of Western anti-humanism have found their most manifest expression in current anti-immigration policies. If you want to uh, find out today where the deeply held long European anti-humanist traditions are manifesting themselves, you don't have to look further than Europe's anti-immigration policies. They are all there. Uh, and the later, these traditions of anti-humanism, of which we know too well, because for too long we have been the objects of this experimentation, both in the continent and in the new world, these traditions are used today as a means to wage a social war at a global scale. So, uh, in order to imagine a different modality of sharing mobility in a world that is becoming smaller and smaller, we cannot take as our starting point these categories. So we have to look into other archives of humanity. And in this regard, African archives uh, provide a very rich uh, set of uh, uh, precepts and ideas 
which might be absolutely critical uh, to build, rebuild, repair uh, a world that is more and more common. I'll give you one or two examples. There are many, and then I'll conclude. You see, pre-colonial Africa might not have been a borderless world. But where they existed, borders, first of all, were always porous and permeable. Permeability. As evidenced by long traditions of long distance trade, circulation was fundamental in the production of social forms. The most important vehicle for transformation and change Mobility was the driving principle behind the delimitation and organization of spaces and territories. So if you want, we didn't have borders. What we had were networks, we had flows, we had crossroads. They were more important than borders. We have to recapture that tradition and use it for ourselves in the continent, but also put it at the service of an entirely different world. So, what mattered the most was the extent to which flows intersected with other flows. So, this was a regime of flexible and yet generalized intersection in which uh, a high degree of mobility existed almost at, uh, across all uh, strata of society. Uh, um, today a slave, tomorrow a general in, in the army of the kingdom, and so forth and so on. I won't go into traditions of hospitality, which were, by the way, extended to every person, enemies included, uh, when they arrived uh, uh, in the land of another, and so long as they were peaceful, strangers were not treated as enemies. Outsiders had ample possibilities to become fellow inhabitants, and the right of temporary sojourn was quasi-universal. I promise not go too long into this, because there are uh, many uh, examples. Let me end now by just recalling one thing. You see, at a deep historical level, African and diasporic struggles for freedom and self-determination have always been intertwined with the aspiration to move and change. Whether under conditions of slavery, Atlantic or Trans-Saharan, or under colonial rule, the loss of our sovereignty automatically resulted in the loss of our right to free movement. This is the reason why the dream of a free, redeemed, and mighty African nation what Marcus Garvey called a bright star among the constellation of nations. This is the reason why this dream was inextricably linked to the recovery of the right to come and go without let or hindrance across this colossal continent. The continent is indeed colossal. It will take you almost 11 hours to travel non-stop, to fly non-stop from Cape Town to Casablanca. Non-stop. There is objectively no reason why one single African young person should lose his or her life trying to cross the Mediterranean to reach a place where nobody expects him or her and where he or she is not welcome. But in order to 
put an end to this scandal, Africa has to open herself to herself. And if this must happen through the abolition of colonial borders, then so be it. Let's organize and abolish colonial borders in our continent. This would be in tune with the tradition of abolition, which has been absolutely central to the history of black freedom worldwide. The abolition of the slave trade, the abolition of colonialism, the abolition of apartheid, and today, the abolition of colonial borders in our continent. But the abolition of colonial borders in the continent is not simply a step to uplift ourselves. It should also be our gift to humanity at large. It should be our gift to humanity at large because um, this is not about withdrawing into oneself. It's not about allowing oneself to be inhabited as Europe today is by the obsession of one's own place. It's not about being among one's own kind. It's about contributing to the rising of that new region of the world where we will all be welcome, where we will be able to enter unconditionally, where we will be able to embrace, eyes wide open, the inextricability of the world, its entangled nature, its composite character, in memory of this earth which we share and in memory of uh, all its inhabitants, humans and non-humans. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, yeah. Professor Achille. Um, I feel like uh, breathing a little bit. Thank you for your strong uh, um, presentation and also to show us, uh, to, to start by showing us these big planetary images of a, this perspective on the actual state of the world and some directions that are very dangerous that we're now uh, going through. And also, in the end, to open to a new way of imagining how we can um, share this world in a different way. I would like to open very quickly to the debate, if there is no immediate, uh, but of course there is. <laughs> so I want to, to give immediately the, the space to, to the debate. There is one there. So there is a microphone. If there is any problem with English, please, you can just put questions in, Eng in Portuguese. Se houver alguma, algum problema com o inglês, podem colocar em português as vossas questões e eu faço a tradução. Uh, I like very much, I, I really appreciated your communication, Professor Achille. My name is Noemia, Noemia Simões. However, I have also, you, you talked about the Europeans uh, making frontiers and creating frontiers, but I am afraid that there is also this uh, fear, this spies of the other among African people. I have also some bad experiences. Uh, for instance, I wanted to travel to Ghana. I sent uh, my passport to, to Ghana embassy in uh, Paris. They never answered me, and they got my visa. I had my passport. I had to take a new passport if I want to, to travel there. 
in uh, South Africa, it seems that the dream of Mandela, of the rainbow uh, and the no racial um, uh, uh, anim animity is this dream is getting <coughs> apart and there is really an apartheid, but it is a kind of a, um, blacks against whites and whites that make frontiers. It's very bad. So it's it, uh, it's very sad to to watch this. That it is difficult that this utopia view that you were presenting and those uh, from Nelson Mandela in Europe. We ha we have also uh, some um, visionaries in Portugal. Padre Antonio Vieira. He he saw <laughs> yes. But let me let me finish. Let me finish. He also had a kind of dream, but, however, he also have. You can criticize, but uh, I'm sorry, uh, there are many, many visionary short, people short. from from uh, uh, Africans, uh, either from European. You can't just put the the bad side on the on the side of uh, Europeans. So my question is. Uh, if it is uh, correct, if you think it is uh, right, to uh, to put just the, the to criticize just the, the policy of immigration of the European and uh, don't also f make a, a self critic, an autocritic, from the part of what is happening also in Africa. That is also a bit of that where there is a bit of. This kind of enmity against uh, European and white people. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I can see that the room is quite excited. Uh, no. Uh, Uh, por favor, agora é a altura de responder. Agora, neste momento. Ok, oh, ok, look. I, I, uh, maybe, may, I mean, uh, uh, I, have, I have no problem with Europe. I mean, uh, I love Europe. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I'm, I'm really serious. Look, I mean, uh, uh, in, in, in fact, in fact, I should tell you that a part of me is European. <laughs> Uh, that 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 uh, you know some of us uh, 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 have ended up becoming or, or, or uh, having part of them uh, uh, European, uh, not necessarily by choice, but because of the vagaries of history, uh, and and I'm not one of those who 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 are anti-European. I really believe that Europe. The world wouldn't be what it is without, without Europe. We would lose something absolutely crucial if we were to, uh, to, to excise Europe from the body of the world, uh, to speak in, in that term. And anybody who, who believes that he or she can do so is, uh, is in a state of delusion. The question is what Europe? What kind of Europe is it that we all need? Just ask, the question is, what kind of Africa is it that we all need? What kind of United States of America? Is it the United States of America of Trump? Certainly not. I mean, some people want it. In Brazil, I hear that they are trying to uh, uh, experiment with that kind of uh, thing in their own country. Uh, I was reading uh, the other day, I mean, including poor people, uh, poor people, uh, interviewed who support uh, the uh, uh, the fascist uh, person who is uh, emerging in Brazil currently, uh, and and they were saying, oh, you know what we need? We need a bitter medicine. And I'm quoting. So so of course, I mean some people, but, but some of us uh, do not recognize ourselves in a world that will be populated or driven by that kind of project, that kind of project that has a history, a history which is, if you, when you look carefully, which is a genocidal history, which is a history of getting rid 
of a whole bunch of lives we think shouldn't be alive. That is the, uh, you see, that's the nerve of, in a world which is facing, um, if there is any really serious challenge, we all face today, of course, in different, at different levels, is the, the possibility of our own very extinction. Because we have damaged the environment to a point where uh, it's difficult to foresee how it is that we will save it. When the biggest challenge, humanity, in its short history, because the history of humans on earth is really short, the biggest challenge humanity faces is to repair the world it has damaged. As a condition of its own survival. So this politics, politics of repair, which we can also call politics of reparation, this politics of taking care of, of caring for, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not interested in lapidating Europe. I'm talking about some of the key planetary concerns we can only embrace and engage with in common. And what it means, because our world is becoming smaller and smaller, and in any case it's too late to partition it again, it's just too late. So if it's too late to partition it again, why are we building walls? I'm not saying that, I mean, you should open the doors and let everybody come in. I'm not that crazy. It's not possible. But, but for sure, there are ways in which we can manage that big challenge of ours, which will be the challenge of the 21st century, which has to do with human mobility. The biggest challenge of the 21st century has to do with the question of human mobility. And it can only be resolved in common on the basis of some political, ethical, moral, humanitarian categories or concepts that are at the opposite of what we see going on here, but also in places like South Africa, uh, it's shared, if you want. It's everywhere. It's planetary. So, look, thank you for your question. It allows me to uh, specify a bit more, uh, be precise about what I thought was at stake. And I would, uh, uh, I would uh, be grateful if we don't lose sight of uh, uh, what exactly is at stake, and we do not get lost in, 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 in the game blame, at least not nowhere. Yes. Any question? Good evening. Uh, my name is Alcides Lopes. I am a Cape Verdean. I am a, an anthropologist. I am studying uh, in, in Brazil, and I'm doing uh, field research here in Portugal at Cova da Moura community. Uh, my question is about intangible heritage. Uh, when you talk about uh, the fragmented future which globalization brought us, uh, I, might, I would like to, to concentrate on the strategies uh, from these minorities. We can uh, talk about uh, intangible heritage here in Portugal, where there was an episode of uh, a festivity which is Cap Verdean, uh, that, is, that was uh, recognized in Portugal as uh, Portuguese cultural heritage, and the situation of the Quilombolas in Brazil. How the politics of identities and how 
can we look better to these strategies in order to build bridges in between these minorities? Have I made myself clear? Have I made myself clear? Oh, sure, sure. sure Thank sure. you. <laughs> no, no, definitely. But you raise a very big question. And, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you, you do have an answer to your own question. <laughs> and, and that you are just... <laughs> and and, and I'm, I'm being very serious. In fact, I would be really happy to listen to you on, on this issue. Uh, because what I have to say about it might not be useful for you at all. Uh, but since you, you asked you ask me, uh, I, I owe you a response. And, and my response has to take very seriously the, um, the fact that to be a minority in any part of the world is not easy. That to be a minority uh, in any society, in Europe, in America, uh, elsewhere, in Africa or Asia, is uh, to occupy, um, to begin with, a position of vulnerability. Because um, everything you have um, can be taken away very, very easily. Um, everything you try to build can be easily destroyed. And therefore, you have to be prepared to start all over again. That, that uh, life, political life, cultural life, when one belongs to a minority, is um, a life uh, that must prepare one to be ready to start all over again, to rebuild constantly, uh, to, to, and, and when victory happens, uh, the gains are almost always marginal. The question being, how is it that one sustains those marginal gains and consolidate them uh, enough to use them as a step to make uh, further, further gains. So that's what it means to be a minority. It also means that uh, your face, and I really mean the face literally, is always susceptible to not be seen, to not be recognized. That it takes a big effort for the majority society to see in your face their own face. They always see in your face the face of some, some other. A face we, we, we're not sure about what it is. We, we poke it, we want to be sure, and in order to be sure, uh, we have to put together a whole set of dispositives of verification. So, so that is what it is. Now, you're asking me uh, how to basically move out of that condition of minority. And here, of course, really depends on uh, the historical situations one, one is facing. For instance, I will give you a quick example. Um, in the case of black minorities who live in France, some of whom are French citizens. I mean, they, they were born there, and they, some have never even set foot in, in, in the continent of Africa. Um, France is regulated by the principle of assimilation that has been the case uh, since colon the colonial period, uh, which has, you know, which is paradoxical because because at the heart of that philosophy 
is the recognition of a radical equality between every single human being. When you look at the concept of the republic, it is from a philosophical point of view premised on the idea that there is no difference between you and, you and I. That's a very good thing, I would, I would imagine. Uh, wouldn't you? No, no, I'm serious. The idea that I'm just a, one human being among many, that I'm not asking for anything special, and that I won't be treated in such a way as, uh, in a way that is different from the treatment of everybody, anybody else. And that's what Fanon is talking about. When you read Fanon, Fanon's project is to be un homme parmi d'autres hommes. Indifference to difference. And that's quite revolutionary. Especially now. Now, I don't want to just dismiss the politics of difference with a slight hand. Because some people find themselves in positions where they have to assume that difference, build on it in order to be heard. That if they don't build on it, nobody will hear them. But difference, as far as I'm concerned, is but a dialectical moment towards something more broader, more common, that what we need now more than ever is some idea of commonality. You see, I live in South Africa. I went to South Africa and moved there uh, some time ago. Uh, and uh, in those days, I lived in Cape Town. Cape Town is a funny place uh, in any case. It's beautiful, scandalously beautiful, but, but when you dig underneath, it's, it's a bit ugly. So it's a combination of ugliness and, and, and beauty. And uh, in those years, uh, not long ago, when South Africans, since you mentioned South Africa, uh, used to celebrate their nationhood, they would come up with a slogan, let's celebrate our differences. And frankly, I found it, I found it really repulsive. Because, why? Because that's what apartheid was all about. So you have lived under apartheid for almost half a century, apartheid based on the celebration of differences, that you are Zulu, you are Kosa, you are white, all of, all of those things, and you have to stay uh, where you are. That's what it was. So it's abolished, and all that you have to say about yourself is a repetition of what you have just supposedly left behind. What we need is to come up with some idea of the common. That is the challenge today. And this requires coalitional politics. Some people will walk with you for 20 kilometers. They won't be able to go beyond that. Others will walk with you as companions over 50 kilometers. How do you build on that companionship in order to propel yourself further ahead to cover the 100 kilometers you need in order to stand for yourself and be counted? So the problem with the politics of difference is, is that today, difference, in fact, has been captured, difference and identity, have been captured by the neoliberal uh, credo. And neoliberalism is using difference and identity to depoliticize uh, all of us, to make coalitions impossible, and to uh, entertain the kind of narcissism without which it wouldn't have any tra traction in contemporary cultural life. So, so we have to uh, uh, redeploy a critique of the politics of identity and of difference at a time when, in fact, those who are the most adept at using it today 
are conservative forces. But I know that these are controversial statements, but I, I think that that's part of what is going on. And that the politics of identity is no longer as progressive as it used to be, let's say, in the last quarter of the 20th century. There have been a massive shift, and we have to invent other modes of uh, coming together uh, uh, that allow uh, everybody to, to find a space in, in this world that has become inextricably linked. That's a very long answer. I promise to not take that long for the next questions. <laughs> There's another question there. Oh, here. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Lucencia Mata, and I teach at uh, the universe at the University of Lisbon, Faculty of Arts and Humanities. I loved your all your your speech, and especially the. The, what I call the utopian solution for the so-called immigration problem, because uh, immigration is called always in, in, in Europe and also in Africa a problem. It's seen, it, uh, people deal with it as, it as if it is a problem. And I loved your idea of going, going back to African archives and looking for the way Africa used to, uh, to think borders. As, uh, as uh, uh, borders uh, uh, have always uh, been permeable, you, you said, yes, I agree, of course, uh, as networks, flows, crossroads. That the idea of starting thinking this problem, um, uh, of starting dealing with this problem from inside Africa. My question is, or I don't know if it's a question or just a sad statement, is the way African leaders think, the way uh, even the African Union, which is, uh, which, which, which is um, uh, uh, heritage of um, African organization, you know, found in 1963, the way people think African think, just look the way uh, Mozambicans are treated in South Africa, the way Congolese are treated in Angola. My question is, when do you think, or what can we Africans start doing to, to, to get this idea of, of opening the borders, the, the so-called national borders in Africa. What can it, uh, um, st uh, teachers, politicians, school, because this is not going to happen now or even in 10 years or even 20 years. That's why I'm, uh, I, I say I don't know if, it's, if it is a question or just a, a sad statement. How can, how can we do, or what can we do to start um, building this idea of no borders uh, among the African countries? Yes, borders as bridges, uh, like my colleague. My friend said now. Okay. Look, there are um, a number of initiatives that are already going on. First of all, 
um, a number of uh, civil society uh, institutions and organizations are, are uh, uh, coming together um, around uh, uh, an umbrella organization that is called Borderless Africa, of which some of us uh, are members. It's a continental organization uh, that is lobbying, uh, in particular, the African Union uh, and uh, putting pressure on, on heads of states to, to deal with this issue, which uh, uh, if they don't deal with it, uh, solutions um, uh, imagined elsewhere will be imposed on them. And we can already see this happening where the uh, uh, European paradigm of border management and migration management, they are trying to impose it on Africa through a whole set of conditionalities will give you this amount of money provided that you deal with your borders and your migration policy in this and in this way. Uh, uh, so a recolonization of uh, uh, the whole migration question by foreign uh, uh, powers. Uh, not in our interest, but in their interest. So uh, our NGO is uh, acting along those lines. So for instance, we have managed to push forward the idea that if you are a citizen of Angola and you want to go to Senegal, because you have a conference there, or whatever, you want to go on vacation, um, you don't need a visa until you land. You obtain your visa at the airport. So we launched that program uh, uh, 10 years ago. And as I speak, there are 34 countries that have adopted uh, this policy, where with an African passport, you can travel today and get your visa at the airport. So we are pushing now to have the rest of the countries abide by this. Um, a country like South Africa is very eager to not uh, do this for uh, reasons we all know about. But, but what they have done, we have pushed them to do, is to uh, liberalize the visa policy, at least in relation to some countries in Africa. Uh, so there's that. The second thing we have been pushing has to do with an African passport. And that has been adopted with the exception that the heads of states so far have extended that passport only to themselves. <laughs> but that's, what not, that's not what we, we were asking for. <laughs> but since <laughs> we have to start from somewhere, the next step is, okay, now you have it. Who else do, should you give it to? So it, it's, that's how you fight. So we have that. The third thing, the other day, at the beginning of the year, they all signed the free trade treaty. With the exception of one country, Nigeria. So if the free trade treaty is properly implemented, it will force the opening, gradual, whatever, of, of borders. So those are, it's not a hopeless case, and it's not as utopian as it might sound. Now, since we are in Portugal, in Europe, what is it that Europe, what kind of Europe do we need to support these kinds of policies? which are in our interest, but also in the interest of Europe itself. Instead of spending millions of euros propping up militias in Libya who end up reconducting slavery under the guise of the fight against immigration, rather than putting money into that, why don't you put money into the kinds of efforts we are talking about. Why don't you put money into a politics of harmonization of African um, identity um, systems? With the technology we have in the world today, that is absolutely feasible. So that we, have, we can exchange, we, have, we can have access to the same databases 
Of course, we don't want criminals moving here and there. Because the question of security is not, is not a false problem. It is a real problem. But there is a way in which it can be dealt with. For instance, if we modernize, technologize, and share our databases about who is whom, because it's the role of a state to know who enters uh, its, the country and all of that. So you can have a program like that over 10, 15 years. Over 15 years, Africans can move from within. They don't have to, to come here. The other thing is, since it is a planetary issue, since the earth belongs to all of us, and we have to hold on to that principle, the earth, as long as that's, this is the only earth we have. I mean, if you want to go to Mars, then you can say, okay, I came first and all of that. But here, it belongs to all of us. And for sure, if it belongs to all of us, there are a whole set of things, rights, in eight rights, that can be drawn from that. One of them is that we have the right, every single human person has the right to visit the earth. The right of visit, which, by the way, was a, a, a consideration in Kant's philosophy of cosmopolitanism. It was the first right. That every single one of us had the right to visit the earth. The right of visit. We're not talking about a country. Okay, now, whether one is able to pay, I mean, you pay to visit New Zealand, that's something else. But in principle, you have that right if you want to effectuate it. And for sure, we have to act on that. So there are a set of uh, fundamental questions like that which require deep intellectual investment because these things are the product of deep ideas. So Africans have to invest in ideas. Ideas about, for instance, the relationship between mobility and space come up with new paradigms that serve to articulate a whole set of policies that are not uh, uh, carceral policies. So, so you see what I mean. That, that, that the times are, are tough, but the times are also really exciting because, I mean, we have to think uh, out of the box and we have to think anew. And, and Africans have to be part of that. Thank you, there is another question there. And then another. Uh, my name is Beatriz Gomes Dias. You, uh, I'm from uh, an association that is called JAS, an Afro Descendant Association. I want to thank you very much for your lecture, and I'm, do, I'm trying to do my question in the, the fastest way that I can because I was thinking uh, when I was hearing you, and I was thinking uh, about this uh, victimization that white people often do when we are talking about white privilege and we are talking about colonialism and the, the European history. And I wanted to, to, to think with you, if you can help us with this question, how can we fight this neg uh, neg uh, neg uh, negation, I don't, denial, denial. How can we fight this denial of about the European history that that um, forge this narrative that uh, the humanism, the European humanism is the strongest um, uh, fashion of Europe dealing with the other uh, with the other people, and in the in the other way, Europe is always trying to find new ways to explore and to 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 force people to to be in a in a in a place of not non-existence. So the question that I want to do is how we can fight this victimization that is so strong. It, it has roots in this idea of white supremacy. So when you are talking about immigrants, the the idea that is that is sell that they are danger. So we must protect ourselves about the, uh, from these people. So Europe Europe is in danger and all the 
European culture is in danger, so we must protect ourselves because we are the victim of these people. Never saying what happened in the past that made this condition that is happening now. So I wanted to, 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 to think, uh, to ask you help for this thought. <laughs> You have to be careful because I, 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 <laughs> I'm not the Messiah. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I hope nobody nobody believes that the Messiah has arrived. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> look, I mean, I'm just, you, know, uh, you understand what I mean, I'm sure. The, uh, I agree with you, I mean, that white, white supremacy, white supremacism, uh, it, First of all, it has never really gone away, uh, uh, but it is on the rise. <clears throat> it is on the rise, and that is a, a fact of our times. Um, it's not on the rise for the first time in our long history. It, it, this has been the case uh, at certain moments in history, and then it receded, uh, not because uh, it wanted, but because uh, men and women of goodwill fought against it, uh, which raises the problem of how do we fight it today? Because it has to be fought. Um, so how do we, first of all, uh, make sense of its uh, resurgence and its re-rise under contemporary conditions? Uh, to what extent is it that uh, its uh, rise, uh, its rising anew, is uh, uh, connected to all kinds of other uh, historical dynamics that are going on? For instance, the uh, <clears throat> the crisis of liberal democracy and of representation, or not the uh, the uh, bifurcation uh, that is going on between capitalism and liberal democracy. There was a moment in history when capitalism and liberal democracy uh, uh, were, were, were compatible. Uh, um, the form of capitalism under which we are living today, I would suggest, is incompatible with liberal democracy. We have uh, reached a point of bifurcation um, uh, uh, which makes it such that, uh, in fact, the whole dispositif we relied upon, especially in the post-war period, just doesn't obtain any longer. So there are major, big, big problems like that, which explain the rise of uh, uh, new white supremacism. And um, the second thing is that white supremacism has always been international that racism in one country, for it to um, prosper, has relied on, let's call them subsidies, coming from somewhere else. For instance, the racist system in South Africa couldn't have survived for so long without the support of the racist system in Australia, in, in America, in Brazil, uh, the fascist system, uh, Sorry? In Port fascism in Portugal, uh, in the case of Angola and all that. So it's an international thing. It's not national. So we can't fight against white supremacism only from a national perspective. We have to build, rebuild forms of internationalism which correspond to uh, the age uh, we live in, which is a technological age, uh, and so forth and so on. The third thing, we have to go back to our traditions of struggle. We, because we are not the first to be confronted with this thing. We have to go back to those memories of struggle. 
including where they were defeated. And when they were defeated, how did we rise up again? Because, you know, we were defeated so many times. But every time we rose up, we rose again. So what allowed us to keep rising when everybody thought that was it? What are those resources? Where is that archive? What in that archive can be redeployed in the contemporary situation? And what else is it that we have to find in other people's archives, including the archives of those we are fighting again, against? So, so you see, it's an intellectual work. It's a deeply intellectual work. It's a deeply cultural, artistic work. It's a work that has to draw from all the resources, some which have been forgotten, others which have been elided, which are part of a long history. And where we made some gains, how did it happen? So it seems to me that it's all of that, a recovery of those memories and the sharing of those memories. We have to recover it and share it. A lot of what is missing in our world today is the capacity to share memories. And for very good reasons. So that question of sharing memories, learning how to remember together, I think it's absolutely important. So those are some ideas. But I'm sure there are many others. Uh, but unless we have a handle on the conceptual work, then a lot of our struggles will be very limited. Há ali uma, uma pessoa que me pediu primeiro. Está bem, e depois, porque está aqui uma pessoa em baixo, que também. Oh. Três, na realidade estão aqui três perguntas. <risos> Portanto. Quem é o primeiro? Uh, nós temos. Hello? Dez minutos. Oh, ok. Uh, uh, professor Member, thank you for your talk. I have a question. Uh, what about China? Um, so, uh? China. The influence of China in Africa, which is growing tremendously on all fronts, economic, political, and also in terms of the example of replacing Europe as an example of uh, a proper, prosperous state that is not democratic, a surveillance state, and I would, I would uh, suggest you look at Xinjiang, which may be a nice parallel to Gaza for maybe your future talks. and. How can Africa not be a victim of China in the 21st century? Thanks. Um. That's a very difficult question. Uh, look, um, okay, uh, okay, just to, uh, to, to gain a little bit of time, um, well, I think, <laughs> I think that Africa has to frame the Chinese question on its own terms. Um, so, I mean, now if we live in Africa and then we have good people who come to visit us, including Western leaders, like, uh, um, sorry? 
like uh, President Obama, uh, <laughs> President Obama came <laughs> to visit, and uh, I gave a, a series of big speeches, uh, the way he knows how to 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 do it, and uh, he gave us a lot of advice as to how to deal with China. <laughs> and he told us, mm, mm, you really have to be careful. <laughs> because you know what? They might not have your best interest at heart. <laughs> Look carefully at your minerals Try to protect them as much as you can. This and this and that. China is bad for you. Meanwhile, he wasn't putting anything on the table. So, of course, we listened politely. And we applauded politely. And then we went on doing our own business. So... So we have to frame the Chinese question in our own terms. And it requires, once again, uh, some uh, element of intellectual force. China, uh, now how do we frame it? One, in, in two ways. One, you see, when you look historically and from a broad perspective, it is absolutely clear that Africa is the last frontier of capitalism. And China has understood that. Europe hasn't understood that. I'm sorry to keep going back to Europe. Huh? But it's just to show you how many different geopolitical actors read the continent. Europe thinks that we are a problem. China believes that we are an opportunity. Europe thinks that, oh, these people, they will all come and invade us. So let's put barriers and love that. Let's keep them where they are. Immigration, you will see, those of you who live here, uh, during the elections, the European elections, that will be fought very soon, I bet a lot of it will be around questions of immigration. And when you say questions of immigration, it means the question of Africa in particular as a very big problem. So this is what is going on. It's the last frontier of capitalism. It means that if you want to invest for the century, not for tomorrow, not for five years if you want to invest for the century, you do it over there. And this, people who manage money, and I mean big money, and I mean finance capitalism, they understand it much more than anybody else. You meet them in Johannesburg, uh, uh, in Nairobi, uh, more and more in Dakar. They understand it. So we have to understand it. For the time being, unfortunately, most of us don't understand that we are the last frontier of capitalism. And that, if we want to relate to China, it must be uh, on that basis, that we have to draw from that. That we have cards in our own hands. Second card we have, and this might sound really utopian, and yet it's not. You know what? a huge part of the future of our planet will be played out in the continent of Africa. You see, that is the biggest event of the 21st century. The biggest event of the 21st century, which requires of all of us an intellectual revolution, a cultural revolution of that, is that as the question of the future of the planet is raised, we have to understand that it will be played out to a large extent in the African continent. You take, for instance, 
the demographic revolution that is going on. By the end of this century, at least one person on earth over three or four will be African or of African origin. For sure, numbers do count. If you look at uh, the questions of the control, let's say the regulation of the biological assets of the universe, whether one is dealing with water, the reserves of water, hydrographic, uh, forest, the second major lung of the world after the Amazon, species, and I mean species, living species, whether microbes or insects or that's where they are. So we have to engage China with a sense of strength. And we have to engage China um, mindful of the fact that this is a long game. It's not a 10-year game. It's not a 20 years game. It's a century-long game, if you want. Because that's how the Chinese government thinks. The temporal consciousness of the Chinese government is not about 50 years. It's about 100 years. And ours is not. So how do we equip ourselves to understand our own destiny in a long history that cannot be reduced to colonialism, that precedes colonialism? And the big drama of ours is that we believe that we were born by the effect of colonialism and that our history stops there. It doesn't. We were there before colonialism. We'll be there long after colonialism. So, so that long durée perspective has to be uh, brought in any strategic thinking of the relationship with the continent. One last point. You know what? We are the only part of the world today that can sustain a new wave of immigration. Millions of people can come and settle in the continent. And I mean millions. It's the last space in the world that is still, can still uh, receive uh, of itself for a renewal of biological life, existential life. We have to, therefore, open the continent to a new wave of immigration. It means, for instance, extending a law you find in Ghana. The Ghanaians adopted in the 80s a new law called the right of abode, A-B-O-D-E. It's a law that says, if you are an African American and you want to become a Ghanaian, you can go and become a Ghanaian in Ghana. If you are an African and you want to become a citizen of Ghana, you can go and become a citizen of Ghana. So we have a huge diaspora that is multiplying. We have to make sure that that diaspora can come and go. I'm not saying now, okay, Marcus Garvey, 2.0, let's all go back to Africa. No. What we have to do is to make sure that our diaspora can move, meaning it can come, it can go. It can come, and those who want to settle back, they can settle back, and they have the right to settle wherever they want in the continent. The Chinese government, in its long-term planification, believes that there will be 20 million Chinese people living in the continent by 2050, which is very soon. So the question is, what do we do with them? How do we prepare ourselves to absorb this amount of people? Is it good for us? You ask me, I believe in, I mean, multi-whatever societies. I believe that, I mean, we should, we should have more people 
who do not look like us. And that, that is very good for our so-called development. But we have to prepare the conditions. So you see what I mean? That there's still a long way uh, to go if we really have to make good use of this historical strategic opportunity that uh, allows us to get out of the uh, uh, um, uh, face-to-face -face confrontation with the West, which allows us to uh, de deprovincialize ourselves and, and get out of this, uh, at times, very sterile confrontation uh, with uh, a region of the world that is, um, yeah. okay, I won't see the rest. Well. <laughs> okay. So it's already 8.34, so we needed to stop at 8.30. We are on time, but uh, I need to say, even if it, the energy of the room is still very alive, I need to uh, say thank you to uh, all of you, and uh, especially to a Chile member. Um, tomorrow... I was so worried I would put you to sleep. <laughs> I <Yeah>. think no. <laughs> so I must say that tomorrow there are two other moments to, to, to uh, continue this discussion. That it's one, uh, it's a uh, shorter discussion here in Kulturgest the, for uh, like a small uh, group of uh, people who register themselves. So uh, it's at 6.30, uh, the inscriptions are closed, so I, I know that some of... I think that some of uh, you are there, so you are welcome tomorrow. There is also, I can say that at 3 o'clock in Cova de Mora, we work together with uh, uh, well, several people, persons who are here, and uh, there will be a meeting that it's the second. Perhaps I will ask you to, to, to say where it is. And uh, Okay, do you have a mic microphone? Yes. Uh, because I don't have here the name of the place. I'm sorry. So can you? It's the second Pan-African uh, conference uh, here in Lisbon. And can you help me, please, with the, with the place? It's in common. Uh, sim, vai ser no Moinho da Juventude, na Cova da Mora, às 15. Yes. Okay, Moinho da Juventude. It's the Afro Family meeting. Yes. <laughs> tomorrow. So I think that you are welcome also. So, and we are very happy with this uh, work that we did together. Uh, I think, I think thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.